ओम सराशिव सरा शंकराचार्य मध्यमा अस्मराचार्य पर्यता वंदे गुरुपरंपरा ओम सीधे प्लीज हो सहनावत सहनाव भुनक्त सह वीर्यन घरवा वह तेजस्वी नवधीतमस्तु मा विषा वह ओ शांति 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 Good welcome to all of you. Welcome also to our many students uh, taking these classes online. We'll continue today with our overview of the Bhagavad Gita. And as I've suggested before, it will help you a lot for years to come so that you can navigate on your own when you study the Bhagavad Gita when to find certain topics. And um we'll begin for recording, okay? very good and we'll begin as we've been doing with some recitation of gita dhyanam uh in the last class we chap we recited the first half of gita dhyanam today we'll recite the second half of gita dhyanam and let's see where we are here 6 mm mm-hmm. There we are. Correct? Yes. That's where we are. Okay. Um as always when I'm chanting please glance at the meaning and then repeat after me. Good. Bhishma drona tata jayadrata jala Bhishma drona tata jayadrata गांधारनीलोत्पलाहवती कृपे न वहनी शल्यग्राहवती कृपे न वहनी कर्णे न वेलाकुला कर्णे न वेलाकुला अश्व थाम विखर्ण घोर मकर अश्वत्थाम विखर्ण घोर मकर दुर्योधना वर्तनी दुर्योधना वर्तनी सोतीर्ण खलु पांडवरन नदी सोतीर्ण खलु पांडव प्रणनदी कैवर्तक केशव कैवर्तक केशव हर फारा शर्यवच सरोज ममल फारा शर्यवच सरोज मम गीतागंधोत्कटम गीतागंधोत्कटम नाख्यानक केसर हरिकथा नाख्यानक केसर हरिकथा संबोधना बोधित संबोधना लोके सज्जन षर हर लोके सज्जन षर हर 
te piya manam muda te piya manam muda bhuyad bharata pankajam kalimala bhuyad bharata pankajam kalimana pradvansina shreyase Pradvansina shreyase mukhaṁ karoti vācālaṁ mukhaṁ karoti vācālaṁ pangum langhayate girim pangum langhayate yat kripatamaham vande yat kripatamaham vande paramānanda madhavam Paramananda Madhavam Yam Brahma Varunendra Rudra Marutaha Yam Brahma Varunendra Rudra Marutaha Stunvanti Divyayustavaihi Stunvanti Divyayustava Veda Sangha Parat Kramo Panisharar Vedai Sangha Parakramo Gayantiyam Samaga Gayantiyam Samaga Dhyana Vastita Tadgatena Manasa Dhyana Vastita Tadgatena Manasa Pashyanti yam yogi no, Pashyanti yam yogi no, Yasyantam naviru sura suragana, Yasyantam naviru sura suragana, Devaya tasmai namaha, Devaya tasmai namaha. Very nice to chant that. Uh, next class, we'll go back to the beginning and recite that. We continue today in our review, starting with chapter 6. We saw the opening verses of chapter 6 in our previous session, and we took them at that time because chapter 6 opens with a carryover from chapter 5. Uh, chapter 5, Sannyasa Yoga, that topic didn't quite come to an end. And so we find the first few verses of chapter 6 continuing with that topic. Chapter 6 is called Dhyana Yoga, meditation, because most of the text is, most of the chapter is devoted to that topic of meditation, beginning with verse 10. So that's what we'll see today. Before we uh, begin reciting, what distinguishes, uh, we'll put it in the form of a question, what is it that distinguishes Sri Krishna's teachings of meditation? There are so many different meditation techniques, different meditation teachers. Here, Sri Krishna has a role of being a meditation teacher. So you might wonder, what technique is he going to teach? In particular, what Alambana. Alambana is a technical term we use for object of meditation. Upon what alambana is he going to prescribe that we meditate upon? The alambana he chooses, chooses as you can see at the bottom of the uh, slide, is the self, one's true self, who he identifies with. So you'll find in this chapter, he says you should meditate on my presence in yourself as yourself. This is the uh, approach of Sri Krishna. Let me turn around a little bit. I can see the uh, slides and we'll begin. Again, first first uh, you can listen and repeat, just to get in the groove, as they say, and then we will recite together. We'll pause from time to time when there's uh, something that, that needs to be explained. So listen and repeat the first verse. 
a yogi in deep solitude, a yogi in deep solitude, whose mind and body are controlled, whose mind and body are controlled, free from attachment and desire, free from attachment and desire, should meditate upon the self, should meditate upon the self. And we'll chant together now. Withdrawing to a wholesome place, neither too lofty nor too low, making a firm seat for oneself, cushioned by grass, deer, skin, and cloth, fixing the mind on a single point, sense and thought movements all restrained, seated there one should meditate, for purity of mind and heart, head, neck, and body held erect, remaining steady, motionless, gazing toward the tip of the nose, looking not at anything else, the yogi meditating thus, whose mind is always well controlled, attains nirvana, perfect peace, in a state of union with me, like a lamp in a windless place, does not flicker, the same is true, for yogis whose minds are controlled, meditating upon the self, when their thoughts have finally ceased, restrained by meditation strong, seeing the self with watchful minds, in the self they remain content, having attained that lofty state, no greater gain can they describe, Thus established they will remain, unshaken even by grave pain. So bit by bit withdraw your mind, firmly grasping the intellect. Fix your mind on the self alone, thinking not of anything else. Those who always meditate thus easily gain the highest bliss. They see the self in everything and see everything in the self. Those who perceive me everywhere and perceive everything in me, such abiding in me. Such yogis are the best of all. Notice his shift here. So it's not focused entirely inside. Meditation is a means to an end. So when by looking inside you discover your true self, or Sri Krishna says, you discover me in your heart. Having discovered Krishna in your own heart, after your meditation is over, you open up your eyes, you see others, and if Krishna dwells in your heart, how can he not dwell in their hearts? That's what he says here in this verse. Now, to introduce the next two verses, um, many people complain that it's hard to train your mind to stay focused on whatever it is you're meditating upon. If you find it difficult, you're in good company. Arjuna too <laughs> complains of having a difficult time. And Arjuna, remember, he was highly, he was a highly trained disciple of Dronacharya, greatest of teachers. So his mind was so well trained. Remember the shooting at that bullseye? I know some complicated story in the Mahabharata. We won't go through all of that. Anyway, his powers of, of uh, concentration, 
what was it? The story was to, to shoot a, a bird, actually, with an arrow. And uh, uh, Drona asked him, do you see the, do you see the bird? Yeah. Uh, do you see the bird? And I forget exactly how it goes, but he says, no, I only see the eye <laughs> of the bird. His power of concentration was so amazing that it was intensely focused in that, uh, in that exercise. So if Arjuna, with that mind, capable of such focus uh, at the time of uh, shooting an arrow, then here he complains that even for him he has difficulty. That's what I mean. You're in good stead. You're in good company. We'll recite these two verses. Arjuna said, O Krishna, my mind wanders much. It's stubborn and impassioned too. I find it so hard to control, like trying to restrain the wind. The blessed Lord said, O Arjuna, it's hard indeed to restrain a wandering mind, but with practice and detachment, you can bring it other control. Practice and detachment. Abhyasa and vairagya. Those two terms are used in many, many texts on, on yoga, on meditation. Now, the last topic in chapter 6 is Arjuna opens with the question about those who spend their lifetime practicing meditation training the mind better and better and better to focus within for the sake of discovering Sri Krishna's presence uh, within. Arjuna asks a very interesting question. Suppose before their meditation culminates in a discovery of Sri Krishna's presence within, suppose they die the day before. So just to make it very dramatic, they're on the precipice of the discovery and then Katam Hogeya. It's over. <laughs> <clears throat> so, Sri Krishna, and by the way, the term that's often used to describe such a person is Yoga Brashta, someone who is Brashta, fallen away from that practice of, of yoga. And Sri Krishna's message is very encouraging. He says that they will pick up the thread, so to speak in their very next life. That there is a samskara developed through your intense yogic practice in this life and that samskara will bless you in your immediately following life. This is Sri Krishna's answer. We'll see these concluding verses of chapter six. <clears throat> Arjuna said, those who from yoga fall away before they gain perfection here, do they not then become lost souls, stranded like isolated clouds? The blessed Lord said, not here nor in their later lives, would their efforts ever be lost? Because no one who strives for God shall to misfortune fall again. They might go to heavenly worlds and dwell in peace for countless years or be reborn in a pious home. Such a birth here is rare indeed. Whatever wisdom they once held will be regained in later lives. Then they shall continue again for perfection to further strive. The yogi, when cleansed of all sins, by effort and restrain of mind, gains perfection through many births, lastly reaching the goal supreme. That concludes chapter 6. 
bringing us to chapter 7. And at this point, I want to remind you of the division of the 18 chapters into six broad groups. So with the end of chapter 6, we've concluded the first third of the Bhagavad Gita. First third where the general topic could be called Twam, with reference to Tat Twam Asi. Mostly the verses have focused on oneself and the main practice of those, there are many practices taught, but Karma Yoga was the predominant uh, practice in that first third of the Bhagavad Gita. Now with chapter seven, we shift gears, as they say, and uh, the topic switches to Ishvara, represented by the word tat in the Mahavakya Tattvamasi. And it's very obvious that the prevalent topic in the middle six chapters is bhakti. It'll become very obvious as we continue. So we'll see chapter seven. We want a little bit of introduction here. Um, the title of chapter seven is Jnana Vijnana Yoga. Jnana is knowledge. Vijnana, a special knowledge or a knowledge that includes experience. And it's very significant that, that we can turn off the slides, turn on cam. Yeah, and I'll be going to the board in a few minutes. Um, it's very significant, the, the choice of title really shows Sri Krishna's approach to bhakti in the Bhagavad Gita. So he begins by talking not of devotion, but of jnana, knowledge, knowledge of Ishvara. Not self-knowledge, but specifically knowledge of Ishvara. And this really shows what is, <clears throat> I think, unique, not just about the Bhagavad Gita, but about the whole Hindu tradition that emphasizes knowledge of Ishvara, knowledge of God. Other religions would probably put more stress on belief, on blind faith. And there's nothing, I won't say it's wrong, but in my opinion, it's weak. And even some Christians acknowledge this. So what, that's, there's a joke, I, you may have heard me tell this joke before, the followers of the Unitarian Church, who are more or less Christian, but have a very open attitude. And the joke is, how does a Unitarian begin her prayers? And this is their joke, so don't think I'm picking on them. So they say she begins her prayers, to whom it may concern. Now, <laughs> I like that because it shows the weakness of a devotional practice that's based on andha vishwasa, blind faith. And what you'll find here in the Bhagavad Gita and elsewhere in the Vedantic tradition is a tremendous emphasis on knowledge, knowledge of Ishra. Because then, instead of praying to someone you have no idea of, you're praying to a reality. Believe it, this is a, a strong statement, but it's true. In Vedanta, by the way, I said before, Hinduism, there's a lot of blind faith in Hinduism. I don't deny that. But in this Vedantic tradition, based in part on the Bhagavad Gita, there is no room for blind faith. Maybe you start, when you first come, you start with blind faith. But the emphasis is solidly on knowledge. For Vedanta, and this is that, that uh, statement, Ishvara is not a matter of faith. Ishvara is a matter of knowledge. Do you believe that I'm sitting here in this chair? Or do you know? I'm sitting here in this chair. That kind of knowledge. And if you say, well, really? We can actually know and experience Ishvara like you see me? Well, you won't see Ishvara sitting on a chair <laughs> someplace, but it is to demonstrate the emphasis on a direct 
knowledge and not blind faith. That knowledge is actually twofold. And let me give you this kind of like a broad overview which will serve you very well through chapters 7, 9, 10, 11. Chapter 8 is a little bit of an outlier. So let me give you that overview. Like I gave you the overview of five kinds of sannyasa, I'm going to give you an overview of two aspects of Ishvara. And the best way to understand these two aspects of Ishvara, the aspects in, in English we call imminent and transcendent, in Sanskrit, Saguna Brahma, Nirguna Brahma. I'll put this stuff on the board in just a minute. But before, before that, there is one metaphor that is so incredibly helpful in understanding Ishura as the ancient rishis understood Ishura, as Sri Krishna understands Ishura. The metaphor you've heard from me before is the metaphor of a dream. You are the creator, sustainer, and destroyer of your dream world. Just as Ishvara is the creator, sustainer, destroyer of the cosmos. But much more than that, the dream world exists within you. The creator and creation are not separate. In the same way, this universe exists within Ishvara. And more than that, in your dream, what is everything made of? Are people made of flesh and bones in your dream? Are, are buildings made of brick and wood? They're made of your own dream stuff. They're made of you, in a manner of speaking. In the same way, all this is a manifestation of Ishvara. Just like your entire dream world is a manifestation of you, in the same way this cosmos is a manifestation of Ishvara. Please notice we're not saying that the universe is a dream. That's not what this metaphor is meant to show. It is meant to show that like a dream world is a manifestation of you, this world is a manifestation of Ishvara. This much describes an aspect of Ishvara we call imminent. Let me show you on the board. board. So we have these two philosophical terms. Imminent and transcendent. That's showing up, yes. So far we're talking about imminent. That which is imminent means inherent, that which is present here and now. And just as you are an imminent presence in your dream world, is there any corner of your dream world where you're absent? That's not possible, right? So you pervade your dream world. Is it not so? So this is talking about Ishvara as the one who is imminent, here, now. The one from whom the universe is not separate. The one who pervades the universe. In fact, the one who is the very fabric out of whom the universe is woven, so to speak. But there's another aspect. Go back to the dream metaphor. One aspect of you is present in your dream world. But there's another aspect of you which is completely unrelated, and that is the person laying on your bed, <laughs> dreaming and sleeping nicely. That's a completely different... The person who's going to wake up, have a cup of tea, and go to the office. What a completely different perspective it is to shift from the you who is imminently present in your dream world Compare that to the you laying on your bed, sleeping comfortably. The you laying on your bed, sleeping comfortably, is utterly beyond the dream world. Think of characters in your dream world. For you, the one laying in your bed, the characters in your dream world couldn't imagine 
such a being laying on your bed and having this dream. That person laying in, in bed obviously represents the transcendent aspect of Ishvara. Ishvara is both present here and now, imminent. Ishvara is also utterly beyond, beyond thoughts, beyond words, beyond all. And the Sanskrit words we use are, are actually not related, not etymologically related, but they're a little technical. And we talk of saguna brahman and nirguna brahman. Now, the saguna brahman is a technical term that actually means Ishvara. Ishvara is Saguna Brahman. Brahman is the absolute reality because of which everything exists. Gunas are qualities, qualities like being a, cr a creator, a sustainer, and destroyer. Those are qualities. So Brahman, absolute reality, with the qualities like being the creator, sustainer, destroyer, that one technically we call Saguna Brahman, and colloquially we say Ishvara, God of the cosmos. But then there's that second aspect of Ishvara, which is utterly transcendent beyond mind and thought, because mind and thought describe gunas. <laughs> Our minds and thoughts and words are really good at describing gunas, but here we have the one who is without gunas. Pure existence. That's a very simple way, but accurate way of understanding Brahman. Brahman is pure existence, in fact, the existence because of which Ishvara exists. So that's the relationship between the two. Brahman, pure existence without any qualities whatsoever. This Brahman is not creator, sustainer, destroyer. But this Brahman is identical to, Brahm, to Ishvara because Nirguna Brahman is the very existence of Ishvara. I shouldn't say identical, that's confusing. But as I said, uh, Brahman, Nirguna Brahman is the reality because of which everything exists, everything including Ishvara. Ishvara means including Brahma, Vishnu, Maheshvara, etc., etc. So this is our overview. And what I suggest is keep this overview in mind as we go through the verses. I may point out some, from time to time, I may point out which of these two Sri Krishna is referring to. But I have a feeling, based on this introduction, it'll be pretty clear to you which perspective, from which perspective Sri Krishna is teaching. Okay, with that introduction, we can return to chapter 7. Good. That's perfect. Thank you. All right. So again, the title of chapter 7, the first of the six chapters on bhakti, begins with jnana vijnana yoga, knowledge of, of Ishvara. So let's see that chapter now. The Blessed Lord said, O oh, Arjuna, please listen now, so you can know me totally, when you completely understand. Nothing here will remain unknown. We'll pause here just to show you very vividly how Sri Krishna... Is Sri Krishna telling Arjuna to uh, be devoted to me? He says that later. He does say, oh, Arjuna, be devoted to me. But that's not how he begins. <laughs> you can know me. You can understand me. And by knowing me, you will know everything else. By knowing that all of this is a manifestation of Ish, By knowing Ishvara and by knowing all of this is a manifestation of Ishvara, we see the relationship between Ishvara and this world 
which is his manifestation. We'll continue. Among the thousands in the world, just a few for perfection strive. Even then among those who try, few know me in reality. All beings, everything that is, from my own nature did evolve. I am the source and utmost end of the entire universe. There exists nothing here indeed that transcends me, O Arjuna. The universe is strung on me like pearls upon a single thread. I am the light of sun and moon and the sweet fragrance of the earth. I am the brilliant glow of fire and in all creatures I am life. For all beings I am the seed and the true wisdom of the wise. I am the glory of the great and the might of the powerful. So of the two perspectives we just uh, discussed, are we talking about Saguna Brahman or Nirguna Brahman? These are all gunas. <laughs> Goes on and on and on and on. All gunas are Ishwara's gunas. Saguna Brahman, Ishwara. Together. From my nature all this evolved. From Sattva, Rajas and Tamas. The world deluded by Maya. Fails to know me beyond these three. Threefold is my divine Maya. It's difficult to comprehend. Only those who resort to me can hope to ever cross beyond. Four kinds of people worship me. Among those who do noble works, the desperate, those wanting wealth, seekers of knowledge and the wise, all the four are commendable, yet the wise they appear to be, to be my very self indeed. In me the highest goal they dwell. So who is the best bhakta? The one who cries the most? <laughs> I mean, just to show that we have some kind of simplistic ideas about bhakti. According to Sri Krishna, the one who is most devoted is the one who knows himself or herself to be non-separate from Krishna. That's what he says here. The one who is most devoted is the one who knows himself or herself to be non-separate from Krishna, enlightened, wise. Together? But those whose wisdom has been robbed due to their passionate desires, they worship other gods instead, driven by their own selfishness, Worshipping to fulfill desires, limited are the fruits obtained. Praying to gods, the gods are gained. But those who seek me, come to me. Please don't read into this some kind of sectarianism. That is Krishna, 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 and nothing but, nothing but Krishna. When he says me, He's not referring to a specific avatar of Lord Vishnu. When he says me, he's referring to Saguna Brahman, Ishvara. So don't, don't superimpose a sectarian meaning on this. There's nothing sectarian here. Together. To all I am not visible, hidden by Maya's veiling power. The world deluded knows me not. 
un unborn and immutable, but those the righteous free from sin, who worship me wholeheartedly, they know the full reality of karma, brahman, and the self. And with this, the very short seventh chapter comes to an end. Notice that we're at the beginning. To all I am not visible. So many people say, how do you see God? How can you experience Ishvara? And the trick is, everything you see happens to be a manifestation of Ishvara. The trick then is to understand that. Ishvara is already present in your experience right this moment. But that has to be understood. Imagine a dream character. A char imagine dreaming and imagine a character in your dream becomes enlightened about their dream world and realizes, hey, this is all a manifestation of the dreamer <laughs> and understands that everything in the dream world, the table, the chair, everything is a manifestation of the dreamer. That would be an enlightened dream character. Imagine now an enlightened person. Same. What you experience is already a manifestation of Ishvara. Ishvara then is not remote in any sense at all. This last line, karma, brahman, and the self, leads to the chapter 8. And chapter 8 is a little bit of an outlier. What I mean by outlier is this. The six chapters, the middle six chapters, are mostly focused on bhakti, on Ishvara. Chapter 8 is a little focused on the topic of death and how to reach Ishvara at the time of death. Very, very specific. But oddly enough, it begins to answer this question. Karma, Brahman, and the self. Arjuna is going to ask about these three. In the beginning of chapter 8, Arjuna is going to ask about karma, Brahman, self, and about death, how to reach Ishvara at the uh, end of one's life. This is the topic of chapter 8 because it's dedicated to this topic of death. Sometimes it's recited at those times, although I think it's actually a much better tradition to recite ch many, many times at the time of death. Uh, many people chant, and I think it's preferable to chant chapter 2 verses 11 to 25. That's the, ch that's the part that shows there is no death. <laughs> no one dies. And the orientation that between chapter 2 and chapter 8 are quite different. So chapter 2 is in chapter 2, Sri Krishna, 11 to 25, Sri Krishna's message is teaching Arjuna, no one dies. Chapter 8, however, is focused on one who is not quite enlightened. And how can they, through some yogic practice, reach Ishvara at the end of this life? It begins with Arjuna's question. What is Brahman? What is self? What is karma? Creation that's left over from that last line of chapter uh, 7. But then he goes on, at death, when souls continue on, how are you to be realized? Well, the other questions are handled very quickly. The rest of the chapter is devoted to at death, when souls continue on, how are you to be realized? The title of this chapter is Akshara Brahma. Arjuna asks, what is Brahman? Sri Krishna replies, Brahman is Akshara that which is immutable, that which is unchanging. And then that becomes the title of the chapter, Akshara Brahma. But the main theme of the chapter is how one can reach 
Ishvara at the time of death. It's uh, fairly short. I think mostly we'll just recite it. You'll see a lot of, well, let, let me, let me, I'll pause a few times and we'll explain together. Arjuna said, what is Brahman and what is self? What is karma creation to? At death when souls continue on, how are you to be realized? The blessed Lord said, Brahman is true reality. Your own real nature is the self. Karma is the cause for rebirth. Creation is all finite things. So Arjun, I had this shopping list of questions. And in verses 3 and 4, all of those questions are very quickly answered, except for the last one. At death, how are you to be realized? The rest of the chapter is dedicated to that. Together? When souls leave their bodies at death, with their minds fixed on me alone, they all reach my supreme abode. About this fact there is no doubt. At the final moment of death, whatever is then dwelled upon, unto that very state one goes and is ever absorbed therein. Therefore, at all times constantly, think of me as you fight the war, with your mind always fixed on me. You shall certainly come to me when dying those with steadfast minds Devotion, strength, and yogic power close every doorway to the world and merge their minds into their hearts, uttering home the sacred word while meditating upon me, leaving their bodies going forth. They reach the highest goal supreme, down from heaven's highest domains. All creatures do return reborn, but those who have come to me, there can be no rebirth again. Unchanging and unmanifest, thus they call the ultimate goal, reaching which there is no return. That state is my supreme abode. There are two paths, one bright, one dark, thought eternal throughout the world. By one souls go without return, by the other they all come back. This is almost the end of the chapter, but let me just make a comment here. The material is a little obscure, and we find some of this, um, some of the, this, we'll call it Hindu lore, is found in, in various contexts. For example, there, there's two paths, one bright, one dark, is referring to the Uttarayana and Dakshinayana, the two paths through which a soul can travel at the end of one's life. You might remember in the Mahabharata, Bhishma has, the, has been given the boon of Icha Mrityu. He can choose when he dies. And because he has that boon, he is laying on this so-called, by the way, they call it bed of arrows. A bed sounds kind of nice, right? <laughs> There's nothing nice about, about <laughs> I know, bed of arrows. Bed is not the right word. I don't know why they call it bed of arrows. He's, sh he's shot through with arrows and he's dying. Anyway, and in intense pain, but yet because of his boon, he chooses to delay his death until Uttarayana, when the sun, I don't know astrology, all that stuff, 
but you can look it up. When the sun moves from one constellation to another constellation, it is now Uttarayana, and this is uh, the preferable time to, to die. This is all, I call it Hindu lore. It's all very, it, it's rather obscure. It's all heavily involved with Puranic stories, with uh, the law of karma, and a lot of yogic techniques, uttering Om and making your soul leave, not through your nostrils, but through the Brahmarandra. You see what I mean by Hindu lore? <laughs> you know, there's all of this. <clears throat> and if you do all of that, there's actually an irony coming here. If you do all of that correctly, now this is for one who's not quite enlightened, and if you do all of this correctly, you can go to Brahmaloka when you die. Tell me, as you're dying, do you think you're going to be able to perform these fairly difficult <laughs> practices? You know, it seems unlikely. Many people don't, some do, some are blessed to be fully aware at the time of death, but many are not, and many are actually, medic many, many deaths are painful, therefore they're medicated with, with morphine, which in my opinion is a great thing. Why should you be in pain in your final moments of life? So at least that morphine relieves the pain, that person can have a comfortable death, but if you're all drugged up with morphine, how are you going to you know, direct your soul to leave through the Brahmarandra as you utter Om with your last breath. Not happening. Which is why chapter 8 describes the hard way. There are two, two ways to do anything. There's the easy way and the hard way. There's a silly Indian way of showing that. There's an easy way to touch your nose. And then there's the hard way <laughs> to touch your nose. <laughs> this is the hard way. The easy way is to understand what Sri Krishna taught back in chapter 2. <laughs> because if you get it, you're enlightened. You don't have to do any of this. This is a way to get to Brahma Loka, but it indeed is the hard way. That brings us to the final Verse of chapter 8. Yogis who clearly know these paths into delusion never fall. Therefore, Harjuna, always be steadfast in yoga constantly. That concludes chapter 8, which, as I said, is a bit of an outlier. When we go, we'll start chapter 9 in our next class. You can turn on cam. Thank you. <coughs> and um, in chapter 9, we're back to Ishvara. Uh, so chapter 8 is a little bit of, a, of an outlier, so we'll continue. Our, uh, and by the way, chapters uh, 9, 10, and 11 taken together is just absolutely breathtaking to me. And uh, I think we'll enjoy going through those chapters uh, in next week's uh, class. About next week, um, let me remind you, uh, uh, Ganesha Chaturthi is a week from Monday. So next Saturday, um, at the time of our meditation session, we'll begin the meditation session instead of with my introduction, we'll begin with a simple puja. So um, next Saturday, please come at 10 o'clock. We'll celebrate uh, Ganesha Chaturthi with a simple puja to Lord Ganapati, Lord Ganesha, and then followed by a meditation on Ganesha. That will be next week's program. Um, let's see, tomorrow, sudden, uh, Sunday, we have satsang at 6 p.m. If it's raining, we'll meet inside. If it's not raining, hope, hopefully, we can meet outside. And we'll conclude today with our brief prayers at the altar. Om 
गणपति वामहे कविंगवीनापमश्रवस्तम ज्येष्ठराज ब्रह्मना ब्रह्मनस्पतहानशृन्वन ऊतबीरसारण ओ महागणपत नम ईश्वरो गुरुरात्मे मूर्ति भैरविभागिने व्योम व्याप्तहाय दक्षिणामूर्त नम वसुदेवसुत देव खम सचानुरमर्डनम देवकी परमानंद कृष्ण वंदे जगद्गु सर्वे भवन्तु सुखिना सर्वे सन्तु निरामया सर्वे भद्रा पश्यु मुखभागे असथो मदगमय थमसो मोतिर्गमय मृत्योर्मा अमृतंगमय ओ शांति 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 ओम तत्सत्